Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Uddham tamham sankham namasami. Sivabuddha says that if we practice metta meditation, so loving kindness, even for one moment, as monastics, we have done our duties uh, to deserve being supported by the generosity of others. So as alms mendicants, we um, are constantly, yeah, we depend on the lives, on the generosity of others. Um, and the Buddha always tells us that we're constantly in debt, but he also tells us that whenever we um, practice loving kindness, we kind of have, you know, we're doing all right. So I was thinking, yeah, okay, that's kind of like the end of the talk. I've done, <laughs> <laughs> done what I had to do. <laughs> right, see you all later. <laughs> practice loving kindness, but really very interesting, right? How powerful this practice is and we can see how beautiful and comfortable the mind is um, after doing even just a few minutes of loving kindness meditation. Um, I'm usually on a bursic type, so metta meditation is um, the recommended antidote. But as every good uh, aversive type, it's the last meditation practice I want to do. <laughs> but then whenever I do it, then afterwards I'm like, why don't I actually spend all my time doing metta meditation practice? You can see the strength, the power, the, the beauty of a happy mind and how it's, we have the power to actually point it in the right direction. We have the power to really shape our experience of mind. So especially if we go on meditation retreats, sometimes it can be quite stressful, quite unnerving. We have to, well, we can't ignore our defilements anymore. We can't um, get distracted with lots of different things um, like we normally like to do. And sometimes Buddhist practice can feel like this burden rather than this vehicle of liberation. And we're like, well, you know, I'm actually enjoying food or uh, chatting with my friends or shopping or whatever it is. It's more gratifying than this torture that I'm putting myself into. <laughs> and that's, I think, the right opportunity um, that presents ourselves to um, actually practice some kindness towards ourselves and not push ourselves too much to, um, you know, we can get very self-critical, but instead self-loving ourselves, actually, um, sometimes it's a powerful way of really seeing how beautiful this practice is and that when we're, you know, suffering while practicing, actually, we're not really practicing the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha says that this practice is good in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. So we're supposed to be happy people, happier and happier and happier. So if that doesn't happen, then we should go and talk to someone who's ahead of us in the path and see and check what are what it what is it that we're doing um, that it's not you know quite on track. As I was saying earlier, you know, as, um, as monastics, we rely on the generosity of people. So I have Suda here in front of me. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Suda is a delightful um, being that has recently entered uh, my life. I'm always very happy to see her. And is also an amazing cook. <laughs> All the residents, in, uh, you know, <laughs> they've all had uh, the opportunity to benefit, uh, partake in the offerings of Sunda, so they all know what I'm talking about. 
it's very interesting because you know she's been bringing um, offerings, food offerings at the monastery. And when I first started my practice, um, my Buddhist practice, I realized that you know people were like, "Oh, how can you be celibate? And how can you you know renounce this and that and uh, entertainment?" But actually, I have no problem with um, all of these things. Um, yeah, entertainment, whatever, movies. I mean, we're not even, even in the 60s or 70s anymore where there was a highlight of like actual good cinematography. All of the stuff that is done these days is kind of trashy blockbusters. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I'm not really into that stuff. Um, celibacy is like, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's not these days in the West, it's not the time where like, you know, there's um, the mystery of uh, what is out there. It's kind of like the opposite. It's the alternative thing actually these days to be, <laughs> um, it's the opposite of the 60s. In the 60s, um, people were alternative by, you know, sleeping around with a million people. These days, I think it's more alternative to actually be celibate. So anyway, all of that was a really big deal for me. But being born in Italy, a really strong, big land of sensual pleasures. Actually not being in control of my food anymore was unexpectedly the biggest source of suffering. And also the practice that it was actually very difficult for me to understand the purpose of it to begin with. Because um, it just didn't seem like that much of a big deal, you know? And Every day here at the monastery and in every single monastery that I know of, um, definitely in the Theravada tradition, we have this contemplation before eating where we uh, reflect the purpose. Why are we eating? And so we reflect it's not for fun, not for pleasure, not for adornment, not for beauty, like all the different reasons that normally uh, we might um, eat for, but only to sustain my, my spiritual practice. And I was like, all right, well, definitely I don't use food for adornment. And I, I got that one <laughs> at least, but not for fun. Mm. <laughs> Maybe also not for beauty, but I was like, well, what's the big deal, you know? Even if, I, if I'm overeating, biggest sort of side effect is that I get a little overweight and chubby, but you know, I'm not that superficial, so who cares? <laughs> And there was this sense that actually food um, was this source of happiness that then was somewhat reliable, actually. You know, if I was feeling a little depressed, the fridge, you can open it, very easy. <laughs> right? much easier than uh, having to get a drug addiction. I have to go out and like figure out where to find, you know, there's a supermarket, there's a farmer's market, there's this, there's like, you know, the resources are much more easily accessible. And there is a level of refinement to the, to the experience that if one knows how to do it, then it can be quite, quite enjoyable. So once that, um, you know, was removed from my experience. That was actually very challenging for me. Very difficult. In the Theravada tradition, we have the precept of not eating after noon. Um, so in the evening, we only have certain tonics um, that are allowables. And at the very beginning, I hated the hell out of these allowables. <laughs> they were really not fun. <laughs> You know, you can have cheese. Cheese is possibly the most fun um, of them all. Or dark chocolate, actually, for those who like chocolate. But I don't like chocolate. And I didn't like cheese without bread. So I was like, it's just so much dukkha, so much suffering. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I started practicing with it. And, you know, it's the, you see how this precept, it's not a moral precept because there's nothing wrong, you know, inherently wrong in... Um, eating afternoon, but it's something that once you start taking it, taking the precept, well, first of all, it gives you an insight in the mind, in the fact that, well, actually, first of all, you don't need that much food to begin with to survive. It was the first realization that I had in the mind. I was like, oh, okay. It's actually
actually quite arbitrary to have three meals a day. And pretty much a reflection of the wealth um, of um, society of these days. The majority of people, I mean, if they had one meal a day, actually, <laughs> in the history of, of humanity, it was a big deal. And even this day, in lots of parts of the world, that is the case. So actually, three meals a day is already like a lot and very arbitrary number. Morning, midday, and um, evening. Then also seeing how the body gets habituated and starts feeling hungry a lot when you first get on the eight precepts and having all sorts of, of strong, strong, um, both physical and emotional mm, sensations. And how the more you practice then mm, with the eight precepts, then all of a sudden all of these get attenuated. It's not terribly different than any kind of addiction, really. <laughs> Stop smoking cigarettes, so you're like, oh, your body and your mind um, freak out. Um, but then after a while, you're like, oh, I don't even know why I was smoking in, to begin with. All right, so there's all like a sort of um, a, a process to it. And then of course, if you rely on um, the donations of other in a, in a monastery, you never know what is going to appear. Sometimes um, some good food is going to appear, sometimes some terrible food is going to appear, sometimes some bland food is going to appear. And at the very beginning, I was struggling a lot with uh, the bad food. Oh, that was horrible for me. Uh, Abra Jikani, and apparently we have a strong attachment to food. I feel like food is our national religion. Um, like un, untold, <laughs> unofficial <laughs> religion. So we have all sorts of defilements and crazy obsessions. The only reason why I'm aware of it is because there's not that many Italians practicing Buddhism and I was the only one struggling with it. And you know, all the other ones for other, from other countries are like not relating to what I was sharing. So I was like, okay, maybe it's some neurosis um, that, <laughs> that I have that needs to be looked at. And in fact, that's, that's very much the case. But after a while, you know, I was like, okay, I can tolerate this. I can tolerate really bad pasta. Um, <laughs> and actually I can focus on the kindness and generosity of people bringing the pasta rather than the fact that the pasta is not really, you know, it's overcooked. Nobody, <laughs> except for Italians, <laughs> cook it at right the, at the whatever neurotic time that we think it's um, appropriate to cook past that. So after a while, you're, it's like a losing battle. Why are you expecting for this thing to be in a different way? Um, or for the sauce to be in a particular way? So you can make progress. And then for the most part, I would say we kind of have like, in this country anyway, um, bland food. You go to Taiwan, you go to Asia, it's more challenging. But <laughs> in the US, for the, for the most part, it's kind of like, it's pretty average. So you can like, yeah, I was like, oh, I've made so much progress. It's pretty good, yeah. It's not one of my major defilements. I'm not really looking forward to breakfast and lunch. So after you know, a few years, I was kind of like quite, mm -hmm, you know, with my arrogance, like going, yeah doing pretty all right, hey, with, uh, with this practice. And then Suda comes. <laughs> <laughs> and I see, you know, this food on the table. And in Italy, actually, the, these really renowned chefs say that food, in order to be good, has to have three factors. It has to be good at the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. So the beginning is before you eat it. So you look at it and it has to look appealing, appetizing. Then while you're eating it, the experience needs to be pleasant, has to be good. And then afterwards, once you're finished eating, your body should feel well, should feel, you know, nicely. So usually, you know, um, hardly, unless you go to a really good restaurant, Hardly any kind of food has all these three factors. <laughs> a lot of times actually it looks good, then you eat it and you're like, oh, very disappointing. <laughs> or 
or you eat it, you're like, you know, and then afterwards, I have really so much regret, but actually so does food. <laughs> so three factors, you look at it, I saw it and I was like, wow, this is great. It looks really awesome. I try it and I'm like, I thought it was going to be disappointing, but actually it's better than I thought. <laughs> Then I overindulged and then afterwards I was like, oh, definitely I'm not going to be able to do, you know, anything. I'll have to sleep the entire afternoon. I'm going to regret it. No, I was actually full of energy. <laughs> so very interesting. I was back to square one, you know, so that you gave me a lot of good, good practice. So then I was like, oh, so much easier to practice when you don't have appealing things, right? I was like, well, I'm not really transcending actually food. You know, so that's very conditional happiness. And when you see, for example, when you read the suttas, um, how the Buddha was experiencing, um, actually, I, I, as I was eating, um, so this Buddha was also uh, recollecting the suttas where the Buddha, uh, you know, obviously he. Uh, was born in India, and so he was talking about you know, the rice and all the different um, uh, sauces and etc. <laughs> I was like, oh wow, this is exactly what the Buddha was going through. <laughs> it was actually quite quite lovely in that way as well. Um, but yeah, the Buddha of course was offered all the most exquisite food, also the most horrible food too, because he would go and actually. Um, you know, live on alms and all, accept alms from all groups of people and from all places in the country. Um, but what was his attitude towards it? It's not that he was like just doing the ascetic practices, the renouncing practices, and completely ignoring anything that was pleasant. So that's not the purpose of Buddhist practice, but rather he was actually. He had reached the point where he was undisturbed, whether the food was extremely pleasant or extremely unpleasant or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. He was there with the experience. He could still taste the food, he could still have the experience of the food, but he would not cling to the pleasantness he would not want for that experience to either disappear or to continue. And he would also not ignore that experience. So a lot of the time when it's neutral, you know, we think that, oh yes, I'm, I'm practicing well, I'm eating just the right amount of food, and to a certain degree it's true, but actually most of it we're ignoring it. We're kind of like, okay, let me get it done. <laughs> done with, you know, I have to survive, so I'll just eat this, this meal, it's all right, but we're not actually experiencing it, we're not really seeing it. So it's very interesting because now Suda has been coming for a few times at the monastery, so the first time she really caught me by surprise, <laughs> so I failed. <laughs> Incredibly the test. <laughs> Reminded me of when I had first got into to India actually uh, as well 14 years ago or so that I was that was the first time I had really experienced Indian food because literally you know you, there's Indian food everywhere but there's you know it's very different when actual Indian people are making it for you know in their households or in their country just like any kind of cuisine. Um, so I, I thought I had had Indian food until I went to India and then when I went there I actually became almost obese after by the end of the month. So there it is my Achilles heel. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the first time I was like, oh wow, this is just like 14 years ago. But then I got prepared. So we have the dana calendar in the kitchen. I was like, oh, she's coming in a few days. All right, I'll prepare myself. <laughs> and so we have a few tricks actually on how to deal with, to look at our experience. Um, very mm, useful tricks sometimes. You know, we can get very much taken from the texture or the smell or the, the taste of things whenever we're experiencing food. 
So typical thing that one does is, you know, as a monastic is to mix all the ingredients together because that's basically what happens when they are in the stomach. So I tried that the second time, mixed everything together. But actually everything she makes <laughs> also goes well together. So I tasted it, I was like, oh, wow, it's actually even better than the single. <laughs> like, damn, that doesn't work. <laughs> So there was no way, no opportunity to look at the repulsiveness, for example, of the experience of food. The reason why we mix things together is that um, perhaps we like the pasta and we like the, you know, the side dish when they are by themselves. We like the pizza perhaps by itself. But then if you put chocolate, for example, on top of pizza, very few people uh, we'll have a, a pleasant experience, right? But that's fundamentally what happens when we are in this, when it's in the stomach. So there's lots of different, you know, ways to look at the actual repulsiveness um, of, of food, but that didn't work either. So this last time I was like, okay, what am I doing wrong? So I thank you so much, Suda, because actually it was a really good, um, good teaching. Um, to really look at the experience and recollect the teachings of the Buddha. And so fundamentally, whenever we're experiencing suffering, it's because we're not fully seeing how things are. So what is it exactly, for example, that we experience as pleasant? So it's like, instead of now trying to fight with the pleasant experience of this food, which by the way, I'm just attaching to it even more because it's not that it was going away. I was seeing Suda on the calendar and I'm like, oh, my seven, my six days, my five days, my four, three, two, one. Yes, it's finally here. And then I was like, oh, have a bad experience. So it was really like not comfortable, right? And I was like, okay. So now I know I'm going to have a good, um, a pleasant experience, and I'm going to actually really look at what is this pleasant experience like. And so I started eating the food. I first actually observed it, looked at it, appreciated the composition, saw it neatly, and started also observing um, different consistencies instead of overlooking it and going already basically I, I realized that I was tasting it already before it had even actually gotten into my mouth so there was a lot of storytelling on the on the food a lot of um, extra information that wasn't there so I wasn't really actually seeing it to begin with so observing it and then putting it in the mouth and really seeing what does actually a pleasant feeling look like? What is it? And I actually contemplated for quite some time on it. And it was interesting because the more I was observing, looking for the pleasantness, the more my attention field of attention was expanding. And then I started noticing a lot of things about the food that I hadn't um, really observed. So there's lots of actually spices in Indian food. And one really interesting thing that it does is actually, it's not only this part of the, of the body that has you know, a physical sensation, but it's the entire body. There's a heat for example, that happens. I don't know what spices uh, <laughs> you use, but it's like sweating without sweating. There's an openness in the chest. Um, a lot of interesting sensations that go way beyond what the tongue experiences. And the more I was observing this, the more it was um, the more my mind wasn't latching onto one particular sensation and clinging to that sensation. So I realized that fundamentally what a pleasant sensation is, the reason why then the pleasant sensation becomes uncomfortable because it stops 
doesn't last anymore. We want for it to keep on going. And in terms of food, even though the, you know, like you can have a big pot, but there's just so much that you can put in your stomach, right? So as you um, are actually experiencing that, if you only latch to one element of it, I mean, if you only observe one element of it, you will latch to that element and you're actually ignoring the rest of it. And I have that insight of what, why the Buddha says that actually whenever we are not um, observing, we're not really understanding neutral sensations, then they're painful. I was like, but if we're not understanding them, how can they be painful? And then it occurred to me there, so I was like, it is painful because also it creates the conditions for you to latch onto uh, what you perceive as pleasant. And then create this long sort of endless pile of suffering where you're just, you're this hungry ghost, you know? There is no much, it's not enough like um, sensual pleasure in the world that can ever satisfy you. But instead actually it was a pleasant experience without the attachment to it, or at least without 90% of the attachment to it. I still have a 10% <laughs> there, but much progress. But it was so interesting just by pointing the attention to it. And we see how it's no different than, um, you know, practicing with the breath. It's no different than when we are looking at the breath, you know, prior to meditation, who ever even paid attention to the breath? And actually, even as we have learned meditation, how much during the day are we aware that we're even breathing? Do we even recollect the mind? Do we bring it back there? And we see that whenever we do that, though, that practice, then peace and happiness arises in the mind. And so it was in the same way like being present with the experience. We don't necessarily have to have an unpleasant experience in order to transcend suffering. We can actually be with a pleasant experience and observe it. And that will actually give us the conditions, the strength to then understand what an unpleasant experience is. And I had a blister on my foot and we went on a walk actually um, this past Last week we were going every day on a walk. I remember this blister at a certain point was really hurting. And instead of going, once again, with the, I want this to stop. I don't like this. I don't want this. May it be. I was like, what is actually an unpleasant sensation? What is an unpleasant feeling? So thanks to Sunda's teaching with food, <laughs> I was able to do the same um, the foot taught me the lesson, you know, and I was able to just walk and actually the blister opened up and there was pus and whatever, and I wasn't protesting and I was able to just be with it because it wasn't really a big deal. It's not that anybody was, you know, cutting my foot and I had to go to the hospital and I just had to put a band-aid the day after. Um, but we can make it such a big deal in our mind, whether it's a pleasant sensation or an unpleasant sensation, we build it up so much and we don't allow ourselves to really experience how things are. And that is basically the process when we have an insight in how we create illusion and how we create suffering. When we are instead understanding, we experience things the way we are, then we get closer and closer to what the Buddha is trying to um, teach us point us in the, in the right direction. And we get closer and closer to freedom from suffering. So we understand, you know, it doesn't become fiction anymore. We're like, oh, okay, so what, what is the, the way out of suffering, you know? So while we're familiar with gratification, we're familiar with, um, you know, the danger, but the escape, we always look for a different sensation, right? 
in the senses. That's the only vocabulary that we have. So we're like, okay, I don't need, the shoe is hurting, so let me remove the shoe and then I will be happy. Or the, you know, I don't like the food, let me have a good, some good food or, you know, whatever it is. We always shift in terms of our, of the senses. That's the only vocabulary that we have. But the Buddha tells us that there's a different, different way out of suffering, which is understanding the cause of suffering, desire, and letting go of it. It's a cessation of suffering. And it becomes an experiential understanding. I'm like, okay, there's a different way out. And I can do it in these small little sort of um, ways throughout my daily life. I don't have to be in a meditation retreat 24 seven and vegetate, um, <laughs> vegetate or levitate. We think we levitate, but mostly we vegetate when we're on retreat. <laughs> but we have these ideas, right? These, you know, ideas that that's what the practice should be like. But in reality, actually, there's always an opportunity to practice. When I used to do retreats, at the end of the retreat, the most common question we always had was like, oh, how do I you know, transfer these teachings in uh, the real world or my daily life? And that's when it's a sign where we're really not understanding what this practice is. And of course, retreat environments are very useful in order to hone um, you know, our, our skills in order to develop the concentration, develop um, the mindfulness that then support um, our, our wisdom, our understanding of things as they are. But we need to constantly investigate the Dhamma, constantly see how is the Dhamma relevant in my daily life and how am I behaving? Like what is, you know, we're not really different from one another. We all go through exactly the same, the same thing. You know, we're, as soon as we, perhaps right now I haven't been um, moving uh, for over an hour. So you're like, oh, I guess one wow, she's like, like a rock, it's incredible. <sighs> After two minutes <laughs> of meditation, I move around. That's exactly how I was when I first started, right? So it's not, it's not that Ayasoma was born that way, or Bhantasudata was born that way, or Andrew was born that way, or Suda was born that way, or Jesse, Jason, like there's not anything essential or particular to us. It's just creating certain conditions that produce certain results. And fundamentally, that's what the teachings of the Buddha are. They're very practical teachings. Where the Buddha says, you want that result? Well, these are the conditions that you want to put in place in order to get that result. And whenever we do that, then we get the result. It's also great when you try to do the opposite, thinking that you're going to get that result and failing, that's where faith <laughs> in the Buddha arises in my mind. Or like, okay, uh, yeah, there's no way to <laughs> outsmart the Buddha. <laughs> but yeah, really understanding that we're not unique really understanding that we all go through exactly the same um, trials and tribulations. And that's why these teachings are applicable. They're relevant today. You know, in the United States and West Orange, New Jersey, I'm an Italian uh, monastic who immigrated here 14 years ago, 12 years, I don't even know anymore, right? And these are relevant to me, no different than to people in ancient India 2,500 years ago. How miraculous is that? Find me another thing that is so, such a classic. <laughs> used to work in fashion, so. Something, yeah, very interesting. There's not one thing. 
even wine, uh, you know, they say it ages well, the things that age well, after a while they, you know, go bad. <laughs> and it becomes vinegar, but not the Buddhist teachings. And people in ancient India were going through exactly the same trials and tribulations that we go through today. They might even have, you know, they didn't have computers and the internet and whatnot, but suffering was, and the causes of suffering and the way out of suffering is exactly the same. And this is the miracle of these teachings that have been preserved um, in Asia. This is the miracle um, of practicing. And the miracle of also understanding how we are really not that different. And that's how we can start having compassion for one another too. We're like, okay, yeah, we're all a big bundle of greed, hatred, and delusion. But we're all working. We have the teachings um, that can support us in our path towards liberation. And we're all making progress um, on the path and supporting ourselves along the path. And it's such a beautiful thing. So these are some reflections that have come from seeing Suda <laughs> and benefiting from uh, generosity. Um, so if you have any um, questions, thoughts, ideas, um, feel free to bring them up. thoughts, ideas, you can also say all of you said is rubbish. It's totally okay. I'm Italian. I don't get upset. <laughs> it made you hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, hunger is a um, great opportunity to look at your experience. What is actually actual hunger? In reality here, we're so spoiled, we're so enwrapped with wealth that we actually, we don't even know what hunger is. Yeah, I actually remember when I went to India, that's when I learned what hunger was, not because I was experiencing it, because I saw someone who actually uh, was eating cement um, in order to trick their stomach to, to think that it was um, somewhat full and not having hunger pants. And that moment, I would, wow, I had that glimpse of how no idea what hunger was. So you can go to in fasting mode, actually, it's very interesting um, to experience water fasting. Because you can see, you can get then a better sense of what actually is, you know, the addictive mind that is experiencing hunger and what is actually like a physical bodily sensation of hunger. And it's remarkably, remarkably, remarkably um, different. Um, so there is a process where you, you know, the first three days, your mind goes completely insane and you're no different than any addict, literally. Um, it's the only thing that you want to do is stuff your face with food. Um, and then after three days, interestingly enough, the body starts adjusting and actually it becomes pleasant and hunger disappears. So you start seeing how <laughs> the mind also has a huge role in the, in the body perceptions. And then afterwards, um, at least this has been my experience, your body, instead of wanting, sorry, your mind, instead of telling you what it wants, it tells you what it needs. So instead of craving for, I don't know, uh, hot dogs and chips, I don't know what people <laughs> like, you actually want, um, spinach or you want um, fruit like things that are actually nourishing your body there's a huge shift um, and that's when that is actual hunger like your body needs nourishment 
as opposed to your body wants and craves things. So it's very interesting. I feel like that's why actually fasting is incorporated in pretty much any spiritual tradition that I'm aware of, whether it's Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, um, Hinduism. Yeah, like there is everything that every spiritual tradition has fasting. It's a very insightful way to look at this. Is there a such thing as attachment towards the practice? Attachment towards the practice? Yeah, it's a wholesome attachment. <laughs> so there is the, what the Buddha, there's a simile of the raft that the Buddha gives. So um, we're on one shore and we're trying to go to another shore. And so we have the teachings of the Buddha uh, that are this raft. And so we take this raft well, as we are crossing, we really don't want to get, we don't want to let go of the raft, you know? We want to <laughs> stay on it and be very, um, yeah, <laughs> attached to it as much as possible. But then once you've, re you've reached the far shore, are you going to keep on like holding the, the raft there? No, you just let it go. But you want to reach the shore first before letting it go. So there are certain things that are wholesome, um, and that's the Dhamma. They are the teachings of liberation. So we don't want to get too intellectual about things and like um, then risk missing the, the essence of the practice. So I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, okay, well, maybe then we can end the evening. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, tomorrow there will be weather permitting a uh, volunteer day. <laughs> so you're welcome to come to the monastery. It will be uh, an informal, informal day. We'll, so we'll be doing a bunch of chores um, to keep the, well, I don't know about the grounds since it's, it might be raining, but maybe the indoors um, functioning. There will also be a meal offering at 11 a.m. So you're welcome to uh, come. I heard that there's going to be Sri Lankan food offered. <laughs> so yeah, you're welcome to show up and um, yeah, you're also welcome to bring food to share if you like. Um, and uh, anything else, Duncan? Uh, I don't think so. That's all I can think of. But next week, um, that will be Labor Day weekend. On Monday, that happens to be also Labor Day, will be the new moon. Uh, so the Opasa will be doing a day-long retreat here at the, at the monastery. So you're welcome to come and practice. Um, big chunk of meditation. We still have one month of good weather, of warm weather where we can be outside and we don't know what the conditions are going to be with this new wave of the pandemic. So I encourage you all to take advantage of, of the time to, yeah, to gather together and practice. So that's gonna happen. And every Sunday we have something going on here. I can't remember what next Sunday is, um, but there's something you're always welcome to, to show up. And of course, we have uh, live streams um, you, on YouTube every, um, well, actually these days, a um, lot of days of the week, but usually the resident monastics on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday um, share teachings. And then we have different, actually have a bhikkhuni from India that is um, sharing teachings uh, every Saturday morning. Um, and also a bhikkhuni from uh, Germany, from Berlin, and that tunes in. So we're taking advantage of the, of the, <laughs> of the internet to um, get more in depth the teachings with Dhamma. All right, so hey, thank you for coming. So we can end with three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.